Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast. I'm Matthew Bruni, and joining me once again is Shay Dixon. Shay, we're here on a Saturday afternoon. I've showered, and I have recovered from another long day in the sun watching LSU football practices. Everybody asks, where's Shay? Where's Shay today? Where Grinding on recruiting, man. We've got nonstop. New- LSU needs to stop getting commits. And they said, they said Shay just sent team. you out here to, to, to sit in the heat, and I was like, yep, there he you is. You get paid. You know what I mean? It's a job <laughs> you get to watch a top 15 football team. Watch football team. Yeah. You get a little tan going out there. Um, get to but, in fellowship, you know, friends, fellow media yeah. members. Yeah. Make some friends along the way. That's, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Um, but yeah, so for was, all you driving home from work, Matthew's complaining that he spent today watching. It is Saturday though. So maybe you're not at work today. And Matthew uh, is. Yes, it was. Was, Thank was, you for uh, going out there. Matty B has hit every practice so far, so uh, we are definitely kind of going to. I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, talk to uh, there, a lot of parents were there today. Um, a lot of the parents uh, were, were on the sidelines, roaming it, feeling the heat as well. Um, Collage Cobbins' dad was was right there getting into it. Collage won a couple of nice reps today, and he was like that. And someone was, was like, who was that again? Who was that? And he was like, that's my son. Yep. 48 Collage Cobbins. Yeah, this is a hand game. Yep, yep. No doubt about it. So it, it was it was it was fun. It was a good day. Um s- s- kind of like a pseudo scrimmage like um they had some 11-11 early, 11-11 late. So we'll we'll get into all that. Brian Kelly talked afterwards. So um where do you want to start? When- yeah, let's start there. Well, I'll take the mic since I've been so deep into recruiting that you've uh you've carried the torch in fall camp. So uh I'll play a little host today. Um I listened to Brian Kelly when he talked. You were there. Sounds like we've got a combination of precautionary reasons, keeping a guy like Chris Hilton, your starting receiver, out if he kind of comes up limping off of the ankle. You know, and he's a guy who's had some injuries, but not like he's had shoulder surgeries and all that. Uh, Brian Kelly said he'd be fine, but it appears the a stomach bug is wiping some guys out now. They were, they've been minus some starters. And as Brian Kelly said, shout out to some guys who were playing through it. Yeah, uh, what DJ Chester missed practice today with that said bug going around. Um, he said the weeks, I think both weeks, brothers, he said, were, were playing through it. Uh, there was another one who I forget um, playing through it. But like you said, it's, uh, it's good that it's happened two weeks before the game, right? So you have some time, and especially since I, they don't practice tomorrow, and I'm not sure they even practice Monday um i know tuesday is when they really ramp back up but you have a couple days here to where you can get back into it before you get into game prep and um everything picking back up on on tuesday so yeah that's that's the big one um people are obviously concerned when they don't see dj chester it's like is he injured is he out for a significant amount of time and it doesn't seem like that's the case with him sideline they did pull garrett dellinger over there at center plugged in tyree adams at left guard which was interesting to see. Um, but I think with, if DJ Chester is healthy, I think he is still the, the starting center. Oh, a million percent. And he will be. He'll be He'll be healthy. He'll be the guy all year that takes over for Charles Turner. And they also brought Cohen Eccles in, flipped him from A&M. Uh, he's a backup center for them as well. So I would assume probably, though, if something were to happen with DJ Chester, the Dellinger probably would go in there because he's your yeah. most experienced. Then you've got Tyree Adams. We've talked about him a ton. He can come off the bench and play. Some tackle if you want to slide Emory Jones inside, or you could even play, you know, put a new guard in there. Uh, I don't think they would go straight up true freshman like they did with DJ Chester a year ago. Yeah. Uh, but Chester will be the center. Your other four guys are all returning starters. Uh, I was just pulling up. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the guys who were sick. All of them are Georgia boys. Uh, I don't know what's uh, <laughs> in the water with the weeks. And the, they're not used to Louisiana. The Oconee County and uh, the Conyers boys, but you know, those guys uh, are all sick right now. Uh, you wrote a story this week, Matty B, kind of updating uh, the injuries or at least kind of where things stood midway through the week uh, and then kind of gave your thoughts on uh, what it meant, what could come. Uh, but let's run down that real quick. Jacobin Guillory, he's your starting nose tackle, a big piece to this defensive tackle room that doesn't have – a ton of proven depth or maybe just needed more over the off season, which is why they got into the portal back at practice again, I presume. Yeah. Back at practice again. I think he's, he's fine. There was a concern when he went down and obviously anytime somebody holds their knee or has their knee looked at, you're very, very hesitant, but he was back the next day. So that's 
uh, a big, big, um, a big development for them that they that Gillery was is healthy because they obviously can't afford to lose him. Uh, yeah, and and thanks you to see right now. Um, in a and I'm being serious. Uh, Texas and a and both lost their starting running backs for the season during fall yeah. camp. So. Um, and I think Texas lost their bat, their second running back as well. So Texas had a Texas had a slew of yeah. Of so the the injury bugs going around. Um, knock on wood out there for the LSU fans that um, it hasn't bitten yet, obviously. But one running back that people have an eye on is coming off of an injury in in John Emery. Um, and he'd hit the portal, came out of the portal. It was kind of a one of those things where it was like, okay, I'm going to do a six year and pass up the NFL. I got cleared for the six year. I'm back at LSU carried my workload in the summer. And I think people are forgetting about him a little bit uh, right now, just because we talk a lot about Josh Williams, the veteran starter, Caleb Jackson, pushing him to be that guy. Someone we think is a second year player is going to really break out. He had some great moments as a true freshman, but we've seen a lot of really great moments from John Emery and a yes, ball security, something that ironically enough is like Frank Wilson's biggest thing in the world. I think he's had, when he goes through those pitches with the running backs, a lot of them have talked about like he'll send guys to the NFL and they've gone 1300 carries and never fumbled the football. Embry's a guy who's put it on the ground a handful of times, but when you wipe that out, he's electric, Matty B. He was a former five-star for a reason. Uh, where is he at right now? I know he's out there, but how would you eval him coming uh, back off of an injured knee where even John said, hey, look, there's probably still a little bit of a ways to go before I'm 100%. Yeah, John Emery, I've been really surprised at the amount of carries and the amount of snaps that he's got in this camp. I thought, and we'll talk about Zy Alexander, but like those are two guys coming off ACL tears, and I expected John Emery, if he did come back, and when he did announce he was coming back, I thought it would be a slow buildup for him right? Um, kind of get him slowly going in, but it, it, didn't, it took like two practices, and Brian Kelly was like, yeah, we're just pushing him. We're just going to like keep testing him and see what he can do and see everything. And I guess there is a sense of like, this is year six. So, you know, John Emery and LSU, it's like, this is, we have to go all in this year with, with him specifically. And so um, with that being the case, he's gotten a ton of carries. I thought he's looked a lot more spry than I expected him to. He's been um, utilized a lot in the past game, as we know, he's a good receiver. And I think with him being, active i think it gives them a really good third option at running back and there have been a few practices where he's went down and buckled his knee or not buckled his knee but like went and had to get it looked at or stretched out and whatnot but overall i think he's been he's been really good i think of john emory and i think of that auburn game where he got tackled behind the line of scrimmage broke it and then high steps his way to the end zone that really helped kind of swing things he's had so many of those big moments. You wonder again if he can be that guy, and he'll get his chance. Look, Frank Wilson knows what he brings to the table. With Trey Holly still not out there, you've got Caden Durham as a true freshman running back. But that's one position where we've seen Frank Wilson will give carries to guys. Last year, Caleb Williams was getting five or six carries a game. So um, good to see John out there. Happy to hear that uh, he's coming along well. Uh, and you mentioned corner, um, and that's the other spot that is a bit of a mystery because – We'll talk about depth charts here in a minute, but two guys who certainly would be starting if they were 1,000% healthy, one of them probably will be, Ashton Stamps talked about being injured last year and how that kind of hobbled him a bit. He yeah. worked through it this spring, and now at fall camp, he feels like he's getting back to where he needs to be. Zy Alexander, though, tore his ACL last year on an interception midseason. And coming back from that, as Blake Baker told us, is – you can get medically cleared, but mentally, are you cutting on it like you used to? Do you really trust it like you used to? And that will come, but you can't put a timeline on mentally when that happens for a guy like Zy Alexander, let alone just getting back to running full speed, getting back to full, you know, feeling like a football player again, given that he just got cleared into the summer months. So thoughts there. I know you've seen, we've seen a ton of stamps, but yeah. how's Alexander a one-time starter last year coming along? Yeah, um, Stamps is definitely going to start at corner this year. I think he's been really good, like like we said. And coming off of having that like off season where he cleaned up the injuries, and I think he's a lot more confident. Um, we know what he's like in terms of physicality, in terms of being in phase, in terms of uh, being a guy that they trust. So Ashton Stamps is good. Zai, 
I tried telling people throughout the offseason, it was like, I don't expect Zai to be 100% Zai Alexander until maybe like week five. Yep, and I agree. everyone was like, that's, that seems too long. You know, he's, he's cleared. It's been nine, 10 months, whatnot. I'm like, this is what happened with Mason Smith. Um, this is what happened. Even if you go back to uh, Keishon Boutte, who um, had an ankle injury, it was like, he didn't look like himself the entire year. Like there's a mental aspect of it where athletes need to be able to trust themselves. And in order to return to being that hundred percent and it takes time. And so Best case scenario to me was that bye week before Ole Miss where I'm like, okay, Zy Alexander is showing up in practice. He's doing this, doing that, and we need him. Like if they if they need him, then that's where I would I would look to, to play him. So um, he hasn't been in the, the too deep at all really this this fall. So I think they're continuing to work him back. He's done some one-on-one, some seven-on-seven, but it's been very, very uh, few, and in, few and far between for, for him. So we'll see how, how long it takes him to get back into that, the too deep. Yeah, and I've said it before on the podcast. And look, talent-wise, I don't think is what's keeping him out of the too deep, obviously. It's that they're trying to work him back into things uh, at a, a rate that won't set him back. But even when he gets to, let's say, 90 95%, Matty Bean, you're putting him out there, that will be the first time Corey Raymond sees him yes. at his full potential. Like So even then, that begins the, okay, what can you do? Where can I trust you? At? What you know? Where can I use you here and there? So I'm with you. I think that, and I had heard that, look, in the spring, uh, I had sources saying, look, Zai is a guy that it might be mid-season by the time that he's really back there and rolling. So give him time, get him back. You'll need it because, look, you never know. You could have a corner go down, and right around that time is when Zai's back and fully healthy. So I think you take it slow. You bring along P.J. Woodland and Stamps and your younger guys. You've got Sage Ryan there as a vet, uh, as a bit of a placeholder even until – uh, they can get some guys back or bring some guys along, and then maybe he moves back to safety. So um, once again, they've got some options there. I don't know if they're um, the most desirable of options, obviously, but you work with what you got and the new defensive staff. That's why you brought them in for them to figure this out. So that brings me to this, um, and we can go a little big picture here even, but mm-hmm. Brian Kelly, for instance, Lincoln Riley at US, like they've opened no practices really. There's been very minimal reports and, it varies school to school. LSU, Brian Kelly's opened it to the media about as much as anyone in the country. I mean, you've watched a ton of full practices. So give me one. I say big picture. I mean, things that are really going to matter this season. Give me something on offense and defense, a positive and a negative, And you can give me two if you feel like it. But And maybe it doesn't even have to be a negative. Something that you feel really good about and something maybe you're still watching to see where it goes on both sides of the ball that you think can play into this season uh, and kind of the win loss record. Yeah. I think offensively we knew a lot about what this offense was going to be, right? We knew a lot about Garrett Nussmeyer. I think he's going to be really good this year, even with the ups and downs throughout camp. We knew the running game was going to be an emphasis. We knew the offensive line was going to be great. Um, And we knew the receivers, even though they were kind of new are going to be really good. Like that's, that's all stayed the same. Um, I do think the tight end position has been even better than I could have hoped for. And I remember being on podcast with you throughout the off season saying the ceiling of this offense will partially be determined by how well they use Pimpton and green, Gorian Pimpton and trade as green two uh, obviously highly rated tight ends coming out of high school. Gorian Pimpton uh, sat last year for the most part. Uh, green is a true freshman. I said, those two are going to help determine the ceiling for this offense. And that has completely come true and in a great way for LSU fans because they've got they've been terrific in fall camp um Pimpton to me my questions with him in the spring were athletically is he able to you know get up field can he really be a dynamic um can he be dynamic with his speed or athleticism and I don't even know if he needs to because he's embraced blocking and with Mac Markway leaving he's stepped into that role as a blocker and as a physical presence that i think they need so full credit to him and then trade as green is just an alien i mean five, seven, they both are i mean they're both six six guys yeah, they're both, they're both incredible aliens. wingspans like, who what i yeah. mean on on three Corey pimpton was the number four tight end in the country trade yeah. as the number two tight end the five star so 
not many teams out there, Matty B, have two six six options who have catch radiuses like those two do. Yeah, and then you have an all conference tight end and yeah, Taylor, like not to know. mention the starter who's the best tight end on the team. So it's like that room I think has been even better than I hoped it could be. I wanted to see Mason Taylor coming off the injury last year and how sharp he was. He's been really good, and then you have Pimpton and Green. So. It's a it's a room without much depth because you only have three of them now, but those three are all really, really good players. And I think um, there might have been some concern after Mac Markway left, and I understand it because he did play a lot last year and he is a good blocker. But I think Pipton stepped up his blocking. I think Green will get there. And with those three, I, I feel really good. So that's that's my positive, I guess, of the offense side of the ball through – three weeks or two and a half weeks of, of camp. I'll give a small reaction to each of your points. I think that that is so paramount, right? And today, Brian Kelly, for the I don't think it was the first time, but he said, Corn Pimpton's going to play a lot of football, and you can't not play a guy like Trey. He was like, those guys just stand out. And you've been singing Pimpton's praises for two years now, saying you're ready to see it. Yeah. Brian Kelly's saying now it's going to happen. He will be out there, and it's almost impossible to avoid putting Trey Des Green out there when you see what he can do in practice. So Mason Taylor, who I think could, like you said, all-conference type tight end, uh, depending on the year he has, I mean, he can make a run at, you know, a kind of a first, second team All-American type tight end. I mean, he can put up those kind of numbers. He caught, what, seven, eight passes or six passes, seven for nearly 90 yards in the bowl game. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, my point being here is that, with Garrett Nussmeyer and not Jaden Daniels, tight end becomes so much more valuable of a position in terms of the usage. And you describe what those three guys bring. They can all catch it. Two of them in Taylor and, and now Pimpton can block very well for you. That's going to be such a big help for Garrett Nussmeyer this year that Jaden Daniels didn't need, right? We've talked about it before. It was the receivers and it was his running game. He didn't need to dump it off for – eight yards to Mason Taylor to pick up the first down. He would just run and do it. So Nussmeyer, a different quarterback, he'll sit back there, I'll throw it, and I think he's going to tap into those guys a, a good bit. Yeah. A question mark um, I have of the offense is something I've had really since the spring is I think this is a great offensive line. I think it's the best pass-protecting offensive line in the country. The running – game and how that develops not just with the offensive line but in general with their scheme is going to be really interesting because there have been moments throughout camp where they've they've struggled let me pause you there you say that you've thought about since the spring has this not been an ongoing issue the entire time brian kelly's here because yeah. i can remember after the first month of the first season he was here they couldn't run the football at all like they couldn't get a yard yeah then in the second season they ran look caleb yeah. Um, Josh Williams, those guys averaged more than five yards a carry, but the run game was nowhere for running backs, wasn't in the conversation for the number one offense. It was they're throwing it downfield to first round receivers, and Jaden Daniels is unbelievable with his feet. Yeah, this is the first time we're going to truly see can they run the football? Yeah, exactly. And so, I I believe in Josh Williams and Caleb Jackson, and now John Emery as being a good backfield, and now. I think with DJ Chester plugged in at center, he's had his ups and downs throughout fall camp. And now it's on everybody else, I think, to really step up and for um, an offensive line that I think is elite and is going to have Will Campbell will be hell a top five pick in the draft. And Emory Jones is awesome and Dellinger is awesome. Now it's the you you don't have that luxury of, oh, well, Jaden's just going to make a play. It's like you have to make the play. It is on Garrett Dellinger. It's on Miles Frazier. It's on those guys to create the yardage. Offensive line yards is something that's tracked, and they're usually – obviously last year it's kind of warped because of Daniels, but like those guys have to create the yards. It's no longer about Daniels legs or even – honestly, even like Logan Diggs or even, you know, whoever oh, yeah, running right. games. Like the, the offensive line has to make the rushing yards. So that's what I'm interested to see in, in week one and – how they how they do that against USC? We're living in an alternate universe where, uh, and it'll become more of the same when we talk here about the defense. But uh, never would have thought a decade ago that LSU would have some Heisman winners at quarterbacks and all the first round draft picks at receiver were actually putting up thousands of yards in uh, college, and um, they couldn't or didn't run the football. That was the last mile strategy: just run the football, and they would run it all over everybody. But 
they just couldn't seem to find a passing game. And now let's see if they can't put it all together. Uh, number one offense in the country last year. Obviously, you're going to fade back a little bit from that, but uh, staying in that top 20, top 25 will be paramount, uh, and developing a run game will be key to it. So uh, I actually I wrote down for these questions just a position on each of those answers, and it was tight end running back. So we're matched up uh, defensively. Yeah. One big bright spot and one big kind of thing you got to still watch. The bright spot is going to be schematically. I think my eyes opened up today in a significant way um, watching them go 11 on 11 early in practice. Um, you can talk about blitzing and you could talk about being an aggressive defense. And you can watch Blake Baker's defenses the last two years and be like, oh, wow, this guy's aggressive, right? It feels aggressive when you watch them play. Um, being like, however many yards away I was from it and watching them blitz the heck out of Garrett Nussmeyer every single play was staggering. Like it is every play, either Harold Perkins or Major Burns or Whit Weeks, um, Javian Toviano, Ky Kylan Jackson with the twos, like every single play was somebody else coming in and getting to Nussmeyer and honestly making him really uncomfortable. Last year in fall camp, the offense was never uncomfortable this year. Nussmeyer has had plenty of times where Blake Baker and this defense have made him uncomfortable. Now the personnel is the personnel. I think it's, you know, if you just went on paper, the 11 man men that are on the field for LSU this year is not going to be significantly more talented than last year's. Let's say like, I don't think they're taking a huge step up in that department, but what they can do with the pressures and the blitzes that they're throwing at people. And also I, I think what carries some weight to me is Brian Kelly saying that they've cleaned up allowing the big plays. So if you're not allowing the big play and you're able to get pressure like that on right. one of the, I'm just going to say one of the 10 best offenses in the country, then you have a recipe. At least you have a formula for being a capable defense and getting some stops and forcing some turnovers. So I think Blake Baker just came into this with a plan, a mindset, and he has executed that to perfection throughout fall camp because it doesn't – and I know he said he was very um, hesitant, I guess, in his press conference. You know, he was very blunt, you know, saying we sometimes we play too fast, you know, sometimes we're missing assignments, this and that. It's just – it looks terrifying if you're an offense going against a team that just runs at you. And sure, it could – there could be some busts in coverage. There could be some guys that get beat, but like it was really impressive today to watch them just get after Nussmeyer and make him uncomfortable. So that's my biggest positive takeaway. And, and again, doesn't have to be negative, but what is the thing that has to be monitored? If this thing's going to go in the right direction, or if we're going to have to worry about a defense that ranked outside the top 100 last year. Yeah, going into camp, it was obviously defensive line and, and corner were the – or defensive back, I guess, as, as a whole were the question marks. I think the defensive lines answered more questions than the defensive backfields. Like, I feel better about the defensive line now than I do with the defensive back. Um, I still have questions about the corner spots, right, whether it's Sage Ryan or – um, Ashton Stamps, P.J. Woodland, throw him in there. You know, J.K. Johnson, they've, they've thrown in sometimes – the corners major burns i still need to see it like i need to see how effective he is um when the bullets are flying and then the safety spot jordan allen jordan gilbert those are they're fine players but i'm again they're going to have a lot of pressure on them if the defense is as aggressive as i think it's going to be the safeties are going to have to be really sharp the corners the star position is going to have to be really sharp so i the secondary is still a question mark to me i think they're not quite there yet but ultimately you hope that you know the linebackers and the edges can take some pressure off them i agree completely and i look again though mason smith makai wingo who's you know an all-american type player yeah. uh and jordan jefferson who also got drafted they were your three interior guys last year and they got gashed at times in the yeah. run game as defensive tackles you lose all three of them. Um, I don't think you have quite that level of guys. Uh, you know, if you lined up your best three now and best three then. But the hope, I think, is that Bo Davis and coaching and Blake Baker and where they're kind of how they're using these guys and putting them in the right spots and coaching them up kind of negates that, right? Like 
Yeah. You had really good players last year. It was just they didn't have a D-line coach, and it was evident. And they had to bring Pete Jenkins in midway through the season as sure. kind of an analyst. I mean, Brian Kelly even admitted that um, when he had moved John Jancic to the defensive line, that he had never coached D-line before. So the hope is that, and like you said in the beginning, a lot of these guys are the same players. At D-tackle, that's not the case. But is that these coaches can kind of really elevate their level of play through the spring, summer, fall camp, and then during the season, week to week, which I think is often forgotten. Uh, but film study week to week, where here's where we messed up. Let's not do it again. I'm with you on DB, though. There's just, like, I got a feel for who's going to start on the D-line. I don't know yet at DB. Like, I could tell you who I would think. But I think it's also hinging on biding time for P.J. Woodland, others to be ready. Michael Turner, a guy that they have a lot of faith in. But even then, those are true freshmen that are coming yeah. in. And I don't I'm not saying everything's about star rating, but they're not five star number one corners. Like they're not a Derek Stingley walking in here. It's guys that you plan to develop that have natural abilities that you need to coach up and get there. Stingley walked out of Dunham jumping 42 inches and running a four three and you know, weighing yeah. 200 pounds or whatever it was. So the development part I think will be massive. And then, like you said, safety. They've had to give up Sage Ryan and get, let him go to corner until they can kind of figure that out. Where is Jordan Gilbert as a transfer? Is Jordan Allen ready to be a starter after having never started a game before? Does Major Burns elevate his game by moving to a new position uh, as that star safety, that third safety that plays in the box closer to the line of scrimmage? You talked about him being in the backfield uh, for practice on Saturday during the 11-on-11 period. But as you said, how does he look on game days? Uh, so I called this a multi-year rebuild when they went to the portal for the first two years, that became a multi, multi-year rebuild. So I at least like that. Look, you're getting good young corners in high school. I mean, there's no better than DJ Pickett. He's on three's number one corner, but he's not here yet. Yeah. Develop PJ Woodland, develop Michael Turner, develop Ashton Stamps, Toviano. These are all guys that are either freshmen or into their second year of college. You bring this next wave of signees in and you're back on the right track, right? You're no longer re required or relying year to year on, hopefully, fingers crossed, we get a couple portal guys that work out because more often than not, they didn't work out for LSU. So yeah, I'm with you there, DB. But again, hey, look, if you can get a pass rush, that helps the DBs out a whole lot. So uh, I do think coaching is one thing I look at and say that could take a team that has a lot of the same players and pieces and elevate them from where they were last year, which – and many times they just look completely lost. Yeah. Uh, let's hit an ad read. How about it? Let's do it. A little game time. It uh, We're back. Game time's back with us. Uh, they rock with us all football season, obviously. Uh, but uh, with the season coming up, it is time for our first uh, game time ad read. And uh, many of you uh, have used game time before. I've talked to you about it uh, every Friday, or I guess, yeah, every Friday preview pod. It felt like we talked about it, Matty B. But uh, download the Game Time app uh, and redeem code ON3, that is O-N-3, the number three, for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, Game Time app, if you haven't downloaded it yet, it's the best ticketing app that's out there. You hear about it all over. Redeem it with code ON3, O-N-3, 20 bucks off that first purchase. Terms apply. Uh, and as I say, take the guesswork out of the tickets. Uh, and they've got everything, last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. If you are trying to catch a, a you know, different section to be with some friends or whatever it might be, you can do it. They've also got uh, views when you get on the game time app of every seat uh, that's out there, where you'd be sitting, what your view is, uh, and lowest price guaranteed. They do event cancellation protection, which you can sign up for. I've done that before, used it. They refunded me right away, no big deal. Um, even job loss protection, anything that's out there, but concert wise, game wise, you name it, uh, they've got it. Obviously, for us, Matty B, we are a couple of weeks away from Las Vegas, Nevada, um, yes, Allegiant State, home to LSU versus USC. If you're watching on YouTube right now, there is a million tickets on game time uh, for sale. Um, right now, you can see what some of the prices are if you want to be in the lower bowl and pay three, four hundred dollars for it. But uh, I'll give you a little tip here. These prices will come down. Uh, I've seen it every time on game day as we get closer. This being a neutral site game, LSU fans travel well. How many USC fans will be there? I saw that a lot of the 
USC ticket allotment had it been filled completely. So I'm curious if this is a game where come closer to game day, you can't grab some tickets for cheaper. Uh, quite often that does happen with concerts in Vegas and things like that. So uh, download the game time app. Keep an eye on that. I think these prices are going to drop on you uh, and get 20 bucks off your first purchase with uh, the code on three at checkout. O N and the number three. So uh, Maddie B let's move along here um, in the second half. I want to just kind of run down this a starting 11 when they take the field against USC. Let's predict it. I, we can go quickly position by position. You tell me where you would change something or where we wouldn't. Uh, your starting quarterback is Garrett Nussmeyer. There's no doubt about that. Your starting offensive line, you've got Will Campbell and Emory Jones at the tackle positions, and then uh, Miles Frazier and Garrett Dellinger at the guard spots. Both those guys started every game last year yes. and the year prior, so they will yep. all be starting again. And DJ Chester is your center. Running back, I don't know is one to me where I don't really care who starts. Exactly, yeah. It feels like they use a number of guys, but is it fair to say right now Josh Williams has a leg up on Caleb Jackson in terms of usage maybe in game one? I think he starts. I think he starts and gets a good good amount of the carries. Um, it's actually funny because it, Emory and John Emory and Caleb Jackson have gotten like by far the most amount of snaps, and it feels like Brian Kelly told us, verbatim he's like we're just saving josh williams like we, yeah bubble wrap him we're, we're good like we know what we're getting from josh williams so we're, we're not worried about that i think josh bubble williams, wrap josh williams and bubble wrap whoever's trying to tackle caleb jackson and everyone will remain healthy uh one of the weeks brothers got trucked by him this past week but i love the comment the weeks brother it might have been wit but it was wit yeah. Yeah, yeah he said it well i want a guy i want a guy trucking me because he's on my team that means that he'll be doing that to other people i only have to deal with it in practice or in camp so uh, yes, I think that one-two punch. Caleb, do not fear LSU fans. Caleb will be playing plenty. We'll see if we don't get a glimpse of Durham as a true freshman. And then obviously John Emery. If he's healthy, they'll toss him out there for five, six reps, whatever it might be. Receiver, you lose your two first-rounders. Kyron Lacey is your no-doubt number one receiver. He was your third guy a year ago. Moves right up. He's locked down that job. It seems that Brian Kelly and Joe Sloan have been pretty clear that the next two guys, the other starters, are C.J. Daniels and Chris Hilton. Are you going to disagree there? No, I think we've seen that in fall camp. Those are the next two. Um, and I think we we talked about in the spring, C.J. Daniels running with the twos a lot when he got here. And it was like, okay, is he going to be able to make that transition from Liberty, who not only was playing in Conference USA, but was also a run-heavy team, one of the – most run heavy teams in the country to now LSU. And I think it took him one summer and he's back and he's obviously a veteran. He is an awesome athlete. He's got great size, um, great hands, route running, all, all the tools you need. I think CJ Daniels is well positioned to have a big year. He's a guy who came in from Liberty, went over a thousand yards and double digit touchdowns a year ago for a really good Liberty team that made a new year's six bowl. They played yeah. Oregon. So uh, he was the receiver on that team. So a big ad for them. I think it just took him a minute to get adjusted to like you're making the jump from Liberty to LSU. Things are different, new playbook, all that. But everyone I've talked to said he's settled in. The one thing I will say, Maddie B, and you've seen it and you can speak to it here. They relied so much on Brian Thomas and Lacey, or excuse me, Brian Thomas and Malik last year and Lacey that they didn't have to go deeper. This year, I think that more guys will get a shot. Xavion Thomas comes in from Mississippi State. He's a proven guy. He's a junior now. He'll do kick return, punt return stuff, but let's focus on receiver here. He comes in as Louisiana native back home. Aaron Anderson came home as Louisiana native a year ago from Bama. He's finally healthy, and he's actually made some big plays in fall camp. You can kind of see how good he is when he gets into space. You return Landon Ibieta. You return a young guy like Kyle Parker and Shelton Sampson, and we've heard sort of good things about both of them. Parker's consistency. Flash is being shown by uh, a former top 100 guy in Samson. And unless I'm missing anyone off the top of my well, head. The freshman uh, Watkins and Billy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You've got Jelani Watkins, fa fastest guy, one of with Gatlin Blair, two of the fastest kids in the country uh, coming in. And then uh, Colin Billiot as well. And Michael Turner moved to corner. So, uh, but Colin Billiot coming out of South Louisiana was a top 100 player, uh, four star, skyrocketed up the rankings after. Uh, much like Kyron, he was a basketball player for a while, and then by about 10th, 11th grade, he put the focus on football. 
developed a little bit later, but now looks to be on track. Uh, but a year ago, all four freshmen that signed took red shirts. So wouldn't shock me if they get red shirts. I don't know if you want to tap into him in some yeah. way. Jelani speed, maybe um, given he's one of the fastest. I mean, he will run for LSU track and field and be one of their best sprinters. So uh, more than just kind of a football guy who can run track, he is as elite as it gets in track as well. Yeah. Who's next after those three? Like, is there a guy or two that you say, oh, yeah, they are going to be, a, I presume, to be a very big part of this offense? I, yeah, I think it's Xavion and, and Aaron, Xavion Thomas and Aaron Anderson. Those are the next two. Um, in terms of receiving yards and receptions, those are going to be your four and five uh, without including the tight ends that we talked, obviously, about earlier. Um, Parker and Sampson have been, gotten run with the twos so i don't want to like dismiss them i don't want to make it sound like they haven't done anything or haven't improved um i just think with the three veterans you have they're not coming off the field a ton and then Xavion thomas they brought him here yeah. uh, and aaron anderson they brought them there to fill these roles that they're going to fill and they're both third year guys signed yeah. with sec schools coming out of louisiana so yep. you call it veteran you call it experience they've been around enough to know what's expected of them so I like the room. It's deeper than it was a year ago for sure. sure. Uh, and I think that'll be a storyline to watch because it was so heavy on kind of the top three guys a year ago. Who after those top three this year kind of really cracks into uh, a routine role uh, week to week when they get into SEC play will be something to monitor. Um, offense seemed rather straightforward there. Defense, let's see if it's any different. Let's start at the position that's very straightforward, linebacker. Greg Penn and Harold Perkins are starting linebackers, and they're backed up by the Weeks brothers. I don't think we've seen anything different in fall camp, have we, Matty B, or spring? No, I, I think Blake Baker actually really likes that group of four. He said he called them. He said we have four starters, and I know he likes. It looks like he looks likes West Week a lot as well. So that's obviously a good development to have for him. So you got four guys there. He likes. I think they're going to be used in a lot of different ways. They're going to. They're athletic. We know Witt and Harold specifically can cover a lot of ground. And then Greg Penn is just um, the senior that you want next to them. And look, they Baker talked about moving Harold around to give defenses different looks. You can move Harold around and bring a Weeks brother in alongside Penn. Yep. You can bring Harold, move him around just in general. They've got a lot of options they can do there. So feel good about linebacker. Um, and with your DC looking over that group, which is pretty experienced, uh, I think that'll be a really solid unit, which is great. But the totality of the front seven, Savion Jones is your starting D end. Braden Swinson, who's now back, he had to finish up. Uh, he graduated, congrats to him, but yes. uh, on Friday, but had to finish up a Spanish course and uh, missed a little practice. He wasn't injured though, just academic wise, had to get through that. He's now back out there. He's your starting edge rusher. Uh, and then you're starting detach or starting interior players. Your nose tackle would be Jacoby and Guillory. Your DT three tech type would be Gio Piaz, who comes in from Wisconsin. Um, any disagreements there? Uh, or has that kind of been well, that's what we expected. Has that been yeah. what we've seen each day? It it is. Um, I will say with Jalen Lee back. They plugged him in like really quickly into the two deep. And so um he was along with Braden Swinson missed the the first what was it first week or so of fall camp with with the um, doing his classes i believe like you said spanish class um once when Guillory went down that one practice they plugged in Jalen Lee in the starting lineup and that kind of surprised me i think you know JVR Suggs has had a good camp i think you know they've they've played with some Sean Washington and Don McKinley but like overall um, I think it's definitely going to be Guillory and Pius starting. The questions to me come in how they, how Bo Davis rotates because we know the interior defense line position is a is a position where you have to rotate guys. Like you're not going to play a 70 snaps at, unless of you yeah. know, what was it, Makai Wingo two years ago last yeah. week. I think that was two years ago where you played like a snaps. ton of snaps. <laughs> you don't want that. You don't want that. So the we even heard Brian Kelly say a mod bro is coming along as a yeah. true freshman that could give him some snaps this year and would play. Obviously, you want to see Don McKinley, the five-star, what Bo Davis can do with him. Can he get in there and give you some some good looks early on into his freshman season, or at least as it goes on? Uh, they moved Kimo McAnally from O-line to D-line, and he's actually consistently been getting into that mix with the second team or into the third yeah. team. Um, but I wrote about this the other day on the site. 
I was talking to a source and he said, look, after Gio and Guillory, that Bo Davis wants a rotation to be enough to where each game, those other guys can combine to give them more than 30 snaps. So that's a good break for those two starters, because as you noted, a year ago, the year prior, they weren't getting those breaks, uh, not very often, certainly not two years ago. So we'll see. Um, and look, fall camp isn't the end of it. These guys can develop through the season. Then we could see more of them as the season goes on. Um, Savion Jones has had a really good camp. I know he got knocked on a little bit a year ago. We put on some weight because he had to. He had to stop the run playing that uh, DN spot, uh, and that required not just being a pass rusher, but – uh, by all accounts, everyone I've spoken with said Savion has looked really good, much better than he did a year ago in fall camp. He's used to the weight he's carrying. He's strong, uh, and he's really gotten after it, uh, both in the run, against the run, stopping it, and then in the pass game. Everyone's going to sit around and wonder about Womack. And, yes, he's Braden Swinson's backup. Yes, former five-star edge rusher, all the talent in the world. I think when he gets out there and you let him go in those pass rush situations – he can be dangerous for you, but I don't think he's locked up a starting job yet just because I think it's one of those things where he's got to be all in, know everything, be motiv- be ready, be yeah. motivated, put in all that work to jump a guy like Swinson who's older and has proven he's very productive when he's given a chance. So yeah. Womack isn't being forgotten here, um, but I'll say, and maybe this helps kind of push Womack even further, I've heard good things about Gabe Relliford. So Gabe Relliford's coming along as a guy who could get in there and play in uh, the in spot or edge rush or whatever it might be, uh, but help out Kevin Peoples uh, with kind of the depth he's got there. I like that. We talked, I mean, we felt like this last year. I, I like that position. You wonder about what's yeah. going to happen on the interior. I don't really worry about, as much about your edge and DNs. Yeah, no, especially with Kevin Peoples as your, your ends coach. I mean, that's that should help like significantly with how revered you know Kevin Peoples is as a pass rushing coach. So um, you have Jones. Well, yeah, same Portland. with Bo Davis at DT. Yeah, so um, you I like the personnel there in terms of your edges, and when you pair that with Blake Baker's aggressive scheme, uh, I think that opens up the door to where you're not getting double teams as much. You have some one on ones you like, and you can you know get after the quarterback. So. It's a it's a good group. Like I said, going in, I feel better about the defensive line now than I did going into camp. There you go. That's a good positive sign for you. Well, uh, the last spot we'll talk about here uh, in the starting 11 on both sides is the one that you circled that you're still a bit, again, we didn't want to call it worried, but that you still have to monitor. The jury's still out on. Describe it however you may. That's DB. The starters right now are Sage Ryan. It, well, let's go with corner. Sage Ryan and Ashton Stamps. Both those guys started there a year ago at different points. Your two starting safeties are Jordan Gilbert, transferred in from AM. He went to U High. Everybody knows who he is that followed Louisiana football or recruiting, but he's back at LSU now. Uh, and then you've got Jordan Allen, who came out of LCA a few years ago. You loved Jordan Allen coming out of high school. You talked about it all the time, really. Uh, yeah. This could be his time because you're in a window here, Matty B, where you're bringing Kylan Jackson along as a second year guy who is splitting his reps as a backup safety and a backup star position, which is where major Burns is starting at. So when they have this star position on the field, you wouldn't necessarily have a nickel out there. So major Burns at the star, third safety on the field, Kylan split his time between those two spots. They're trying to bring Deshaun Spears, formerly Deshaun McBride uh, out of Denham Springs along, but he's a freshman. We saw last year, the freshman Ryan Yates, who's now transferred out to Cal, but uh, and Jordan Allen at the end of the season, like guys were getting in there for some reps, but it was a ton of Andre Sam and major burns. I would yeah. think they don't want to put that workload on the starters again this year. So instead of predicting kind of like, all right, who is the day one starters? I think that's probably going to be the group, maybe minus one guy. Here's my question. Where should this go? Like, what is best case scenario for this team when you look up in the heart of beginning SEC play, whatever it might be, who would you like to see at those five spots? So I think this hinges on Sage Ryan. Like, is Sage Ryan going to be able to elevate his game at as a corner, or does he need to drop back to safety and play safety? Or does he need to be on the field at all? Like, Sage Ryan to me is so much of what this defense – like hinges on in terms of his potential like this is 
year four for him. This is going to be the year where he either comes through or he gets benched. And I could see either outcome uh, coming to fruition because I don't think he's elite at anything. But ultimately, if Sage Ryan locks down a corner spot and he has a really good year, then I think this defense takes a step forward. If he's not what we think he is, if P.J. Woodland passes him and they have to move him around or something, then I think it starts getting a little sketchy. So um, in an ideal world, obviously, Zy Alexander, I think, is the best corner. I think Zy Alexander at full strength is a guy that last year showed that he can hold up at times, but he's not himself right now. So that's part of the problem there. So um, I like Kylan Jackson. I like Deshaun Spears. Um, I like P.J. Woodland, all these guys it's hard for me to just say to play the young guys going into week one against USC in Las Vegas. I can't say that. So I'm good with the starting lineup right now. I'm interested to see in, and and the thing is if they beat USC, their next what four games are, they're going to be 10 plus or a touchdown or plus favorites in those games. So they should be able to win them and you're not going to have concerns, but at the same time, um, then you get to like Ole Miss and whatnot. So it's as a roundabout way of saying, I feel good about the starting lineup right now, but we'll see how the rest develop. Woodland, Alexander. Um, I know Toviano has been, he's been sidelined for a while, but they've started to work him in more. Um, and he's run with the two to some. So we could see him at the star position backing up uh, Burns. Yeah. I mean, Callan Jackson, if he starts to play more, they've got, They've got options. It's an odd thing, though. It's like the veterans are all the ones who the major burns and sages and guys like that who would be the first ones to tell you, like, I had bad moments last year. Like, it was many times when you looked up, it was one of the guys that is your most experienced guy out there taking a bad angle, missing a tackle, whatever it might be, busting a coverage, and that kind of stuff can't happen. So can coaching kind of clear that up for you? We'll see. Um I kind of viewed it as it hinged on PJ Woodland because if PJ Woodland was developed right. enough at corner, trusted enough at corner, then you could move Sage back to safety. Then you could kind of feel like you had this Sage Jarden major group of safeties that are all what third, fourth, fifth year guy. I don't mm-hmm. is Sage in his fifth year now, but uh, all guys who are played a lot of football, very experienced, done it in the SEC. And that would be the group. Jordan Allen has not started any games, but he's getting his first team reps. So, it again, it's a multi-year rebuild. Uh, and with new coaches back there and Jake Olson and Corey Raymond, I don't think they're going to be scared to test it out. Like, they rode Andre Sam and Major Burns until the wheels fell off. Like, they just never took him off the field. I don't think that'll be the case this year. I think that if there's hiccups, they're going to the next guy. Yeah, I agree. Um, that, Like I said before, that's the – unit i guess i'm i'm still hesitant about going into it so and i was hesitant about last year's cornerback room and was proven correct so here we are again but we we know what the deal is this time going in and we know the expectations i think so i I, it's different it's it's different than last year and they're not facing keon coleman and johnny wilson week one so that's good that yeah that certainly does help um all right let's get another ad read in before we uh get out of here in a minute uh, you know what it is, uh, Maddie B, uh, my perfect franchise, uh, and Andy Ludicky, who we got a very good shout out uh, on the board. I, I'd like to bring it up, actually. I'll bring it up right now. Um, yeah. But one of our uh, longtime posters, a guy we love uh, a bunch, and uh, Cairo Tiger said, big shout out to Andy Ludicky. Uh, had a great conversation with him about how we are looking to franchise our office in the near future. And although that's not his expertise, he gave some great advice, pointed me in the direction uh, of six other franchise support organizations that were able to vet and make the right decision of who to work with. So if y'all see some quote mend chiropractic offices pop up in your city in the next couple of years, just know that Andy was a big part of get that get getting that done and going in the right direction. Uh, that's coming from Cairo Tiger, who's a member of the Bengal Tiger. Anyone who's on the site will see him posting off uh, But Matty B, that's as good as it gets. Uh, Andy is a guy who. Uh, runs my perfect franchise. He's been in the franchise business as a franchisee, uh, owner, part owner, consultant uh, for decades now. Uh, and he's rocked with us for a long time. Uh, basically, and we've talked about it, leaving the American 
uh, or given up on uh, the rat race and, and chasing the American dream or just doing a side hustle or whatever it might be. And, and Andy says it, don't be scared just to hit him up and say, I want to do something. I've got an idea. I don't know how to get started or maybe I don't know what I want to do, but here's what I'm good at. Here's some things that I have interest in. Andy says he's dealt with all of it. Uh, and the best part is it's free to call him like Cairo Tiger did. Uh, 404-973-9901 is his uh, phone number. That'll get you right to him. That's 404-973-9901. Uh, you can email him, Andy, A-N-D-Y, at myperfectfranchise.net. That's Andy at myperfectfranchise.net. Uh, or go to the website, myperfectfranchise.net. Andy's been great to us. Big shout out to him. Uh, cool story from Cairo there. Like I said, he didn't even get Andy. Andy didn't even get his business, but he hooked him up with someone who knew could put him on the right path. And now Cairo's got things in the works. So a lot of people have uh, used Andy, gotten uh, their uh, franchises, or jumped into a franchise uh, with uh, kind of some coworkers, other things, friends, family that have gone in together. Uh, and he helped get them going. So again, give him a call, 404-973-9901. Decades of experience as a franchise consultant, owner, franchisee, uh, and he wants to help out. Big college football fan. He loves everybody over the Bengal Tiger. And again, free to call him, free to reach out, email, any of that, and just kind of feel things out. So put it on your to-do list uh, if it's something that you've kind of been thinking about and write down his number. Give him a call uh, next time you're free. Uh, Maddie B, we are uh, wrapping this up. I do want to say that uh, one thing with Vegas coming up, uh, LSU USC Labor Day weekend, um, and I'll have more details about this. I'll post this to the Bengal Tiger board. We'll talk about it on a future podcast. I'll tweet about it all that. But I am putting some finishing touches with the ESPN 104.5 guys with Freds. Uh, we're going to host a party for the LSU fans with the Bengal Tiger, Freds, and ESPN 104.5 at Circa, which if you're not familiar with is one of the newest hotels, but has all the big screen TVs out by the pools uh, where you can watch all of uh, opening weekend of college football. We're going to do it Friday night. It looks like it'll be about Vegas time, like five to nine range. But if you wear LSU gear free to get in, uh, we've got from talking to everybody over at Circa, a massive uh, place in the back end that they're going to uh, save rope off for us. Um, hundreds can fit in there. I'll drop a link when we finalize it. Um, if you RSVP, we'll get a good feel for how many people are coming. But uh, that will be a lot of fun, drinks, food, all that, and, and get to hang out. So if you're getting to Vegas on Friday or Thursday or whenever, and you're just looking for stuff to do, mentally note that that uh, I will be having a party at Circa with uh, some folks around that will be, will be fun. So Shay's party, block party in Las Vegas. That's right. I'm not paying for it. Show up with, uh, if you, yeah, I think you do get a free, if you wear LSU, uh, anything LSU gear, uh, you get in free and you, I think uh, you get a free drink ticket. Anything after that, Uncle Shea is not responsible for. He got you in, didn't he? Yes. And he got you a free drink. So make the most of it. Uh, but I'll bring y'all more on that. Um, Matty B, great pod. They're, break us down here. They get ready for USC. And by ready, I mean like they start to practice versus what the USC kind of scout team defense, yeah. all that kind of stuff is next week. Is that correct? So yeah. fall camp is nearing an end and the actual practice for the season begins here shortly. Let me, let me get the schedule up. Um, let me get the schedule up here. Uh, don't practice tomorrow. They do practice Monday and then practice Tuesday. And then we're out back out there on Wednesday. So, yeah. Okay. Wednesday. So, yeah. Yeah, all camp yeah. flying by. Um, yeah. And plenty of coverage every day. For real, y'all, the Bengal Tiger, if you're not a member yet, sign up. We spend our money on dumb things all the time. This is actually a smart thing to spend your money on if you're an LSU fan. Maddie B., uh, as you heard in the beginning of the podcast, has had to brave the elements every day. It is 100 million degrees here. Uh, but he's been out there grinding. He's had great practice reports. Been dropping video on 11 on 11 one-on-ones, everything uh, here on the YouTube page. You can watch it on the site as well, uh, but really in-depth uh, breakdowns on the site where uh, we do our best uh, to convince everybody that if the offense is good one day, it doesn't mean the defense is <laughs> terrible. And if the defense is good, it doesn't mean that the offense won't be able to move the football. Yeah. It's just all camp. Yeah. I, I will say also 
probably starting Monday, Monday or Tuesday is when I'll start doing some some dives into USC. Let's so go. We'll, we'll start getting those those up and then slowly well, ramping up as the the game approaches. Obviously. We're teasing it all then. Uh, starting on Tuesday of this week will be the first edition of the weekly uh, AMA, Ask Me Anything, uh, where I will be not on Reddit, but on the Bengal Tiger on the board. Uh, nothing is off limits, I guess. Actually, I'll probably be probably after the first one be instilling um, a 10 commandments of the AMA of uh, what cannot be asked and, and what can't. Uh, and I know if Burke's listening to this podcast or Holy Bull, they're already drawing up uh, the most insane off topic uh, questions to dig into my life or just football. So uh, we'll talk recruiting football, everything in that, but uh, Matty B, we have a lot of fun stuff coming to the Bengal tiger. Give us a like here. Give us a su- what, subscribe here. Hey, yeah. But most importantly, find us on the Bengal Tiger because that's where we're, that's where we're at every day. Yep, yep. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, hope you all um, checked out also our recruiting pod that is I think going to drop after this or before this. After this depends on whenever it is, but check it out uh, whenever it goes up. So um, yeah, we'll be back uh, later on next week to. Uh, again keep talking about fall camp and then eventually start talking about usc so until then we will talk to y'all later